very much for, to the organisers and the Flemish government for inviting me to share a new cadre's experience in the last, I guess, 12 months or so uh, with you. Um, libraries have always played a really important role in digital inclusion uh, in the UK, but in the last year or two, uh, the world has changed. And it's changed not just because we had a new government and a new coalition and a government in the UK, but it's all changed, also changed because the world around us is if you look at uh, the UK population and the way they live their lives and the way that the private sector and media present services and information to people, it's changed drastically. The world is beginning to be organised around those of us that are digital, those of us that are online. So that makes uh, it more important that we accelerate uh, progress towards digital inclusion. So for public libraries, the agenda has, has, has changed. We have a government that is impatient uh, for change faced with specific fiscal challenges, but we also have a world that's changing and, and many members of our population that we need to support um, more quickly. So, when I took this job a year ago, I think the first question that we asked ourselves as a group was, um, are the same policies and support that we provided to get from 20 or 30% of people using the internet up to 70 or 80% of people using the internet, are they going to work to get us close to 100%, or do we need to do different things if we really do want to uh, push on where we have you know, almost a totally uh, uh, connected population. Um, secondly, does government, in the way that it delivers information and services, are we helping or are we hindering? When we say to somebody, when, when we look at the people who use our services, the heaviest, and say, don't worry, you don't need to do this online unless you can use the telephone, you can pop into this office. In the medium term, I'm not talking about today, are we helping them? Or do we need to say, increasingly in the future, these services and this information will begin to be available as a default by digital. It will be available to you in other forms, but the best quality, the most convenient service is going to be online. That's, that's a big uh, question to answer. So are we, are we helping or hindering as a, a government ourselves? And thirdly, if we are going to push and be more aggressive, how do we do assisted digital or supported online? What do we do for those people that really aren't going to need uh, help in the uh, short to medium term or even uh, smaller that may need help permanently? So we've been starting to try and ask some of these big uh, strategic questions and begin to make some progress. So we've taken, about a year ago, we decided to take a slightly different approach uh, in the UK. Um, and the government appointed an independent uh, digital inclusion champion for the UK. It's changed in the last uh, four or five months. Uh, Martha Lane Fox is now the digital champion. She has responsibilities across government online and service delivery as well. But the initial focus was just on uh, the inclusion piece. And Martha is an entrepreneur. She's someone who set up the, one of the UK's most successful internet companies in the dot, you know, dot com boom. But one of the successful ones, the ones that worked, and this was in her 20s. Uh, so she, the internet has, has, has shaped her life to a large extent, but also in another way, because Martha had a life-changing accident uh, after that period, where she spent almost two years in hospital, and actually she slowly rebuilt her social and economic life through using technology. So she's very passionate about uh, the use of technology, both uh, from an industry and an economic perspective, but also the impact uh, it can have on, on real people's lives. So we now have somebody who is an, he's, he's appointed by government, but, but she has a separate budget and her job is to challenge uh, people from across government and industry and our third sector, our charities, to work more collaboratively to see what we can do to get this last 20, 30, 40 percent, but depends on how you define it, of our population uh, regularly online. One of the first things that Martha did was say, we need to talk about something that, that galvanises people more energetic way. So she launched something called Race Online 2012. We call our team Race Online 2012. Um, and it's all about focusing uh, everybody's mind in the UK to see what we can do across all sectors to get as many millions of people as we can online in the next two years. Do we really think that we're going to get everybody online in the next couple of years in the UK? Probably not. Do we think it's worth going as fast as we can? Yes, we do. And so it is a, it is a galvanizing, very ambitious uh, set of targets. Um, so what, is, what, what do we do as a team? How do we work with government? Well, the first thing that we do is we act as a kind of critical friend of government industry in the third sector. We support what we think things work and they're good, but what we think they're not as good or they can go faster, we try and challenge uh, government. And 
after our first year of work a few months ago, um, we published um, the manifesto for a network nation. Here are our recommendations, not just for government, but for industry, for the marketplace, for our charities. Here is a manifesto for how we should work together in the UK to crack uh, this problem over the next uh, two, three, four, five years. Secondly, um, we use Rates Online in 2012 as it's actually what it is, it's a business to business campaign. It's, it's a partnership campaign. It's a way of linking all of the efforts of partners in different sectors together into one big whole. It's not a consumer facing uh, brand, it's, it's, it's something that we use collectively uh, to make people feel part of a big kind of UK wide partnership across uh, sectors. Um, it, there, there have been lots of attempts at partnership at the UK before, but you always get people signing up. The difference about this one is you actually have to pledge to do something. So, for example, some of our bigger companies have pledged to get, you know, some of our, a telecom company we talked to them said they will get 100,000 people online in the next two years. McDonald's has said they will have 100,000 people on Tuesday, working through their stores, through their communities, through their employees. So, we're looking at people, big organisations, to make commitments, but also very small organisations, little local libraries to say we'll get 20 people online here. Everybody um, is part of this uh, community. And the third thing we've been doing is lobbying government hard to make sure there's a, enough community based support to give people that kind of informal helping hand they need to get started. Uh, so we did, uh, actually, it was in the last days of the previous administration. Uh, secure an extra £30 million pounds for our community-based, we call them UK online centres there, centres in libraries and in, in, in other places which help people uh, with their first experience of going online. This is what we broke on our hands when we went to talk to ministers um, and people in the largest companies in the UK. One is that, and this case was well known, there is a social and moral case for digital inclusion. And the more of us that use the internet regularly, the bigger the social and moral case for the people that we've left behind. It's kind of well understood by people, but, 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 but important to make. The second thing we did, which was different, was we commissioned uh, in Bloomshire <coughs> accountancy firms to make that economic case for digital inclusion. One of the biggest findings was that if all of the people in the UK that were, are currently offline moved just one contact on a month, which they currently do offline with government, it would save the government almost a billion pounds a year. Made a big impression on lots of ministers when they realised that actually this group, a lot of the offline are heavy government service users, by helping them get online and accessing government services online, there was actually an economic benefit, as well as a huge benefit to themselves in modern labour market, etc. And the third thing we said to people was, we can do this. You know, we have a huge amount of infrastructure around the country in our localities, which we have lots of ICT and lots of community based organisations which can support people. We just need to sweat it and recycle it better. So we can do this. So we didn't make it sound like this was impossible. We needed huge changes to do it. We, we talked about it more about working more effectively together. And this was one of the central points that I made earlier, that the internet is changing life you know, for most of us. It's the way we organise our lives. It's the way we organise our time. It's the way we communicate with each other. 90% of all new jobs in the UK require a basic ICT skill. You know, lots of jobs are increasingly online only advertised in the UK. We're not helping people say, it's okay, you're unemployed, ring this number for information about you. We need to make sure those people have got this because many jobs are only uh, online. The average household in the UK is saved £560 a year by being online. Even for low income households, that's almost £300 a year. And it's what we do to have fun. You know, lots of us now. It's, it's when we looked at about chief sources of entertainment. And we're just thinking very simple things like family photographs, we're beginning to exclude certain people from things that traditionally have been part of family life. So in the UK, uh, Paul gave us a bit of Europe wide. Um, this was 10 million a year, over 10 million, 10 and a half million. We have about 9 million people who've never, ever, ever been, been online. This is not tried it and didn't like it. They've never used the internet. Um, and of those 9 million, about 4 million are the most socially and economically excluded in our society. So there's a very high proportion of that, of that four million, there's a high proportion of the elderly, a large proportion of the unemployed, and actually quite a large number of adults and families with children. And why should we care? Well, you know, I, I talked about the labour market in the UK. This four million people are also amongst the high, heaviest users 
of government uh, services. Um, and we worked out in this economic report that 20% that of lowest income households in the UK are missing out on over a billion pounds in savings from paying their bills online and shopping online. That's a, that's a huge uh, loss to a group of families that cannot afford it. So, what Martha and the team have been doing is trying to get ministers to imagine a UK where just about everybody is online and what the benefits of that would be, um, and then to begin to, to, to look at what barriers to that and to look collectively at how we might overcome them. This, this, this needs work. It's one of the things we talk about most is we need to explain better what a totally a network UK would look like, but it's absolutely crucial to the argument that, that we're making. And the, the figure at the bottom there shows uh, what. PwC estimate would be the total economic benefit of the UK of having almost everyone online, to £22 billion. Pounds. Um, this is really important. If we want to get close to 100% of people online, we'll have to get the hardest to reach people online. We can't just nibble away at the easiest people who, the, the, the higher income older people who just haven't seen the benefits yet. The way to get close to 100% is to focus on what we can do to help the most socially experienced, what we can do to make services aimed at these people better designed um, around their needs. And this is just uh, an update on, on what we've, we think we've achieved in the last 12 months. I mentioned you do need money for some of this, so we have uh, found some, even in tight fiscal circumstances, we found, uh, based on the business case, that, that benefit to government, we have found uh, some money for our community-based access centres. And this campaign is working. I know that it's, people in government are a bit cynical about this as a concept. Is it really going to work? Will all these people, will, will these companies really support these people? Since March, when we launched the campaign, we've had 700 organisations from all sectors uh, join up, um, offering to help 1.7 million people get online. Say so they only help, help half that many. It's really good. The biggest single pledge so far, public libraries in the UK. The public library network has recently signed the first public sector big partner to help half a million people get online in the next year. So, so libraries will play a big part in this. And one of the things we constantly talk about is not just formal volunteering, but why can't you just help someone that you know? 80% of us in the UK use the internet. 90% of people who aren't online know someone who is. So part of that, all of our duty is to help our neighbours and our friends and our family uh, get online. So we, we've been playing to that a lot. And we've also got a people's task force, which is about 30 people now who've only got online in the last year and they're from disadvantaged groups generally, and we use them to tell the story. So when we launched our campaign in the, with the David Cameron in, in, in number 10, we sat this group of people around the cabinet table to explain to ministers the difference that technology and being online was making to their lives, to try and uh, move on in terms of making this case. And it's an important point. The manifesto that we set out is for a 100% network nation, not for a 90% network nation. So we know this is a, is, is a tough call, but we, we are organising everything around this principle that we really do intend to try and achieve this. Massive challenges. We want to build as much momentum as we can for this campaign. We haven't really started with central government. I told you about the libraries, but I've just got, I think we have room from our job centres all over the country in the UK, maybe 800 centres, that they're going to have a digital champion in every single centre, and they're going to start working with our libraries and our other places to make sure that nobody who comes in looking for work uh, isn't impact on the digital skills. This thing about government online, we've, in the UK we've moved towards putting all government services on one place to make it easy for people. I think we might have got that wrong. We're starting to think that we should put government services where people are online. If people are, you know, mums and they're going to big parent sites, maybe the government service and information for parents should be there rather than trying to spend huge amounts of government money on advertising, bringing people all into the central government site. So we're starting to look strategically at how we do government online. And we started to look at whether we should design services around me or around a group of people in that four million who have different needs. Yeah, because at the minute government services in the UK tend to be organised around people like me rather than people that we're actually targeting for. And the third thing, which is tough, I know for everyone, which is like the private sector and the media, government will start up in the UK definitely moving to digital as the default for some information and services. We'll look at assisted digital. We'll use traditional things like libraries and post offices to do click and print on information that isn't available in hard copy, for example. But this is a direction of travel. And if you think about these big challenges from a, from a public library network point of view, um, that presents new challenges for, for the public library network. Thank you very much.